Thank you. Uh, I'm very encouraged to see this many people care about testing. I was worried <laughs> not everyone would show up. So. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I'm Alexander. I'm a software engineer. I work at uh, Palo Alto Networks, which is a, a cybersecurity company. And um, this talk is about. Ooh, that doesn't work. Uh, Sorry, give me one sec. There we go. This talk is about um, my love affair with Pydantic and ultimate rejection. Um, I really, really like Pydantic, uh, and I definitely feel like I had a, a crush on the source code when I first ooh, found out about it. Um, and so I really wanted to contribute to try and um, be part of the project. Um, but. I, when I had a look at the project, I realized it, um, it wasn't really the right time to, to contribute. Uh, they had kind of shut it down. And so I had a look at um, some other projects that the author had written, and I found one called Dirty Equals. Um, so this talk is going to be about my story of contributing to Dirty Equals and things that I learned from that. Um, but just to kick things off, in case you don't know what Pydantic does, this is like a really simple, minimal example. and um, I want to talk, focus a little bit on how Samuel Colvin, who wrote Pydantic, thinks about code, because that's, that's kind of the thing that um, I, I learned the most from contributing to his projects. And I think uh, what he does is takes things that are internal to Python and changes them in a, a small way in a library um, that has very interesting results. So in Pydantic, sorry, I don't know how to change that, but I'll just I'll just keep going. Um, he is very good at, uh, he, well, yeah, sorry. Here, he's made um, Python check type hints at runtime. So you can, you can see here that um, that b value to my model is, sorry, the a value, I mean, it's supposed to be an integer. But later, when it says um, my model a equals 100, uh, I've actually passed it a list of integers. So I then get an, an error which says, um, oh yeah, this works, uh, that it should be an integer, but you've actually given it a list of integers. So this, is, this has changed how Python normally works. Type hints are normally just type hints. They're just hints, and they don't get checked at runtime. Um, but if you use Pydantic, your program will actually error if the type hint is wrong. So something does happen at runtime. And th this kind of paradigm of making stuff um, change internally to Python in a, in a sort of contained way is what I think is really cool. So, but just first of all, I wanted to talk a bit about what happens when you uh, come across a new open source library and how to figure out if it's worth contributing to, since I think people don't always talk about this, but it can save you a lot of time. If you don't do this, I think you can do a lot of work on a pull request and then nothing happens, which is quite disappointing. So th this is sort of my checklist. The first thing I would check is um, when was the most recent commit? Uh, hopefully it was a merge commit, so it was someone's merged in a, a pull request from someone else, rather than it just being the maintainer of the library adding their own code. Uh, I also like to see what the activity is like on the issues and get a sense of what's happening with the library. And then um, I'm not going to name any names, but on some repos I've seen really, really frightening responses from maintainers, and I think life's too short. Um, so th these are the things that I think are worth checking before you uh, make a open source code contribution. Uh, ooh. But yeah, on to Dirty Equals, which is um, the the project that I did end up contributing to after running some of those those checks on Pydantic. Um, Dirty Equals is a, is a little bit like Pydantic for testing. So if you want to do cool different things with your tests, you, this library is good for you. Um, it ultimately helps you make tests that are easier to write. I also think a bit more fun to write. I, I personally find writing tests can often be a bit boring and tedious. To me, this is a way to add some syntactic sugar that makes it a bit more fun. Um, and it fundamentally lets you misuse the equals operator in Python. So just like Pydantic let you check um, type hints at runtime, this is the kind of trick pulled in dirty equals. It, it changes the way that equality works in Python. Um, which is what it says here on the, on the home page of the library in that box at the bottom. 
Um, and yeah, uh, it's really useful when you're testing responses back from APIs, which I'll explain in a bit more detail later. But I think probably a lot of Python developers work with APIs, and so that's kind of one of the main use cases for this. Um, this is just a very simple example of the library syntax. Um, and yeah, here you can hopefully see how equality is getting misused. We can write a really simple test case and do these sort of unusual checks with new objects from dirty equals. We can check um, in the first line there, does, does the list have length three? And then does it contain the string A? Um, and you can do this with quite interesting syntax with like an ampersand there, a pipe operator, and not equals. And you can chain and combine these. So this is a simple example now, but hopefully you'll see as we go through the talk how you can kind of build on this and um, make it all a bit more, more complex. Then this is probably the kind of pattern you'd be most likely to use uh, in actual production code where you are writing an API test. Um, you here are going to maybe mock out a client and then test that some JSON is equal to something like this. And I think hopefully here you can see how versus just kind of testing this is exactly equal to the kind of response you're expecting, which is what at least I used to do before discovering this library. You can write much more dynamic test cases in a, a way that's quite readable um, using these dirty equals objects. So like uh, here on that avatar file line, you can check that the string matches a particular regex. So I think that's probably a nicer pattern for testing. It's also going to make things arguably a bit more modular if you want to reuse some of these um, dirty equals objects when you're expecting these kind of responses. And you get a pretty nice diff in PyTest. So this is an intentionally failing test where I gave it the wrong, uh, the wrong value for the avatar file. And you can see in the diff, you get the dirty equals object back. For me, this is way easier to read. Um, not right now. <laughs> um, normally, it's way easier to read than just seeing like a pretty long PyTest traceback with some, some regex that um, I'm not really sure where it is. So I think the advantage of making things more declarative and explicit is that when you get around to failing tests and have to fix things, you get these quite nice readable objects. So um, how does this really work, though, under the hood? This, if you think about it, this, is, this, is like, this feels like bad Python. It's not bad Python. I wouldn't be giving a talk on it. But normally, equals equals is a strict equality check. So. Um, like that second line there should definitely fail. Hello definitely does not equal true for a whole bunch of reasons. But if we use this is true like thing from dirty equals, it, it passes because it's, it's a truthy string. It's not an empty string. So something funky has happened um, in order for this to take place. And that's what I'm going to kind of move into for the rest of this talk. Uh, and we're going to get a bit into how equality actually works in Python, which I did not know before contributing to this library. So it turns out that when, um, when you have a statement like x equals equals y in Python, the first thing that happens is that um, x checks, uh, can I compare itself to y, the thing on the right? Um, and it calls the done the equals method, which is what you can see up here at the top. Um, and the important thing from this slide is that this never this code never runs, which is why if you, if you run this, y equals doesn't get called. Um, but, and the reason for that is that this returned true here. So it, it exits here. Uh, this might make more sense if you have a look at this slide. So in Python, equality is designed such that if you return not implemented from the thing on the left, it then proceeds to check equality at the thing on the right. So, here we have x equals equals y. The first thing that fires is done the equals here. Um, you return not implemented in Python if you, you don't know how to compare yourself to y. So x is saying, if I don't know how to check I'm equal to, to y. If y was an integer here, rather than some weird class I wrote, there would be a quality logic here to check if it's the same, the same kind of integer, um, assuming x was also an integer. But the, the really important thing here is that y equals gets called. So that basically means if we write a custom object in Python, which is what all the dirty equals objects are, things that aren't in the standard library, then whatever we write in this done the equals method here, um, 
is going to control how the equality logic works. So using this approach, we, we kind of get to hook into how to do equality checks in Python. And this is from the C Python source code for how PurePath works, just to, to kind of show you how what a sort of good blueprint by someone who knows Python a lot better than me looks like for this. Um, so if a, a PurePath object is trying to compare itself to another object, PurePath is designed so that it doesn't know how to compare itself to anything that isn't a PurePath object. So this is basically saying if it's, if it's PurePath, then go here and do the PurePath kind of comparison that um, is all good. But if, it, if it's not the object it's getting compared to, if it's not PurePath, then return not implemented. So then we go to the object on the right and check um, if that knows how to compare itself to the object on the left. So just to wrap this up, hopefully this makes sense now. Um, this is a kind of flowchart of what happens. If x knows how to compare itself to y, it just does the comparison straight away. If it doesn't, then we see if y can compare itself to x. And that's this bit here is what I'm going to dive into next. Um, why would we care about this? This, when I was first looking into this, seemed pretty weird. Equality works well in Python. Why would you want to change it? Um, but you can now use this to write your own comparison logic and make things give back that they're equal or not equal based off your own logic. Uh, so a really simple example of that is here. Um, and the dirty equals library is a little bit more complicated than this, but this is just some kind of hopefully clearer examples to follow. Um, so this is how you would create a class in Python that you, you say um, is equal to the object on the left if the object on the left is bigger than five. So this, this other argument here that gets passed to the done the equals method is, um, is the object on the left. So that's why two equals equals <coughs> x here is false and um, six is true because obviously six is bigger than five. Um, you can also do this for not equals. So the same kind of logic that I've been talking about also works for not equals. So the idea here is Beyonce is only equal to herself. So hello is not equal to Beyonce. You too is not equal to Beyonce. Um, but oh, uh, it is true that, um, sorry, it is false that Beyonce is not equal to x because Beyonce is indeed equal to herself. So this is. Um, a more realistic example for how you would do something like the is, is I don't know how to say this out loud, is stir, is str class that was in dirty equals. Um, so here, when you, when you build the class, um, you give it a regex argument. And then in the check, um, I'm catching the case where it's not a string, because uh, this, from the name, hopefully it's going to be obvious to people that it's only for a string. Um, I'm going to raise a value error, but if it is a string, then I have my own logic here to basically say, yes, it's equal if there's a regex match, um, but otherwise it's false. So that's, that's the kind of core idea of how you would implement this. In the next slide, I'm trying to work with these dramatic pauses. Um, this is how we would use it. So this regex here is basically saying um, alphanumeric only, which means that um, I get false for only this one at the end. All the other ones are alphanumeric strings, so they pass fine. So um, this is, yeah, we've kind of done it now. We've done our own way of um, writing an assert statement with equality that does really, really funky stuff. Um, just in case this is still feeling very confusing, this is the kind of core logic for how this all, all worked. Um, and Next, you might be wondering, OK, this, this kind of seems fun, it seems interesting, but would I actually want to use it at work? So I thought I would give you a concrete example of some tests that I've rewritten using this that have made my life easier. Because um, I work in, in cyber, um, I uh, often have to, well, not in this job, in my old job, we'd had an API people were, were paying for, and we were sending back data like IPs and hashes. And it was pretty important we'd send back the right kind of hash or make sure that an IP was valid. Otherwise, obviously, people are paying for it, but also it would, it would break things. Um, and 
this, I think, is a much nicer way to check an API response. So suppose you get an API response back that has um, JSON that we turn into a dictionary that has a hashes key and an IPs key. Um, where I worked often, we, we, we had mixed SHA-256, MD5s, and SHA-1 hashes, but we now are, we're sort of transitioning to only send back SHA-256s, but often there were some bad hashes in the response. So this is really easy to test in dirty equals. And by a bad hash, I mean one that's not the right kind of type. Uh, you can just do here, fail the test if um, the list contains an MD5 hash, um, and also check just where that was, um, that it contains a SHA-256 hash. Um, and then another thing that I think is pretty cool is the way this library is designed, it's really easy to create your own logic to run these tests. So suppose you, you don't like his hash or you don't like his IP for some reason, um, uh, and then you want to do your own stuff, um, you can use this function check class here. Um, and here, you just pass it a callable. So here, check IPs that I've defined above. Um, and then you can do whatever logic that you want here. Here, I've just done um, a generator comprehension that basically says make sure everything in the list is an IP. Um, so this will fail if I had a, any kind of invalid IP here. But there's a, there's a lot more sort of complex stuff that you could build up here. And this is, for me, where the writing test bit becomes a bit more fun. This is, I think, quite a lot more fun than just normal sort of, I don't know, I can't really be bothered to write IP validation logic in most of my tests personally. Maybe everyone else is more diligent. But um, that's, that's kind of what it would like at work. And so I'm now just going to recap on, on some of the things that I took away from this and I hope might be useful for you. Uh, after that, I'm going to move on to a couple of other kind of fun things that I think you could take with some of the stuff I've discussed. So. Um, the main thing for me was if you, if you really like someone's code style or their way of thinking about code, to try and get involved, try and contribute to one of their projects, um, even if one isn't active. Um, for me, the main thing I learned doing this was that it, it is kind of OK to change Python internals um, if you do it intelligently. And I feel like I learned from this code base how to do that well. And I don't think I would have learned that if I hadn't contributed to it. Um, and I think there's a lot of other stuff you could do with that. So I was going to show you an example next about um, how Pathlib actually does this. I gave a dry run of this talk to some, some colleagues, and they told me Pathlib does something similar, which I had never really realized. Uh, while this loads, Pathlib basically overrides the Dunder um, true div method in, in Python. So um, it kind of hacked. Uh, hacking is the wrong word. I'm going to stick to overloads. Here, true div is what happens when you say something is divided by something else. It'll be a bit clearer on the next slide. But it's, in Pathlib, it basically says if you're dividing um, an object by another object, just join the path, um, which is how you get, uh, I'm going to do this slide first, really cool syntax like this. So you get. Um, this whole path gets put together by doing this call, whereas this operator normally in Python would mean you have to divide stuff. So I think this is a really nice way to do pretty cool syntax tricks. Um, and uh, this is a really good little example, in my opinion, in, in Pathlib. Um, but I think this kind of approach is something you could definitely put into other libraries. And I also think it's quite a cool feature of Python that you have these Dunder methods that are exposed and you can hook into and, and change things. Um, one last thing that I took away from the, the workshop on PyTest a bit earlier is um, using hypothesis for testing. And I think this would play quite well with dirty equals as a, as a combination. So here's just like a very quick example I put together of how that could work. If you're not familiar with hypothesis, what it's basically doing here is saying, given some hypothesis, give me a, a random bunch of numbers um, within this range. Uh, 100 to 102, 10 to 12, and um, apply them to these arguments x and y. So this is kind of the same syntax as um, parameterizing fixtures in Python, but the difference is that you don't specify the parameters. Instead, Hypothesis gives you a bunch of random data. So the idea is that you um, have a more robust test, since you might be checking for more edge cases. Um, but I think if you then add in some dirty equals logic, so like here I've said, 
uh, sorry, that if um, is, is a prox is a dirty equals class that lets you check a number within a, within a range. So it's going to say approximately 110 with uh, like delta of 4, so max 114 minus uh, 106. Um, I think that's quite a nice combination. I think that lets you kind of have a bit of breathing room around the random stuff that gets input. And I often, if I, I'm on a bigger code base, I write a ton of fixtures and parameterize them, and it gets really messy. And I thought this is quite a lot cleaner. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the end of the talk. I'll share the slides afterwards. Um, here are a lot of the resources I use for it, including some of the, the source code links if you want to kind of dig in and really get into it. Um, and I think I will finish there. Um, thank you very much for listening. Hello. Uh, thank you. And I admire how you were calm when the slides were not working. I would freak out completely. <laughs> I also have a question, actually. Uh, so I use PyTest a lot. And if you assert that something is in a list, for example, and it, the assertion fails, it will tell you nicely, this item here was missing on index three or whatever. Uh, but if I always just assert equalities with custom uh, equality methods, uh, how do I propagate more information to the actual developer who's running the test that why the equality failed, other than returning true or false or not implemented? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's a bit of a paradigm shift with this library, is that you, you don't get that kind of PyTest traceback. So you actually get a really unhelpful error, unless <laughs> your dirty equals object is very clear. So. If, if you did like list equals equals contains uh, x, and then your list didn't have x, in the test failure message, it will say it failed because it didn't contain x. So I think that's pretty clear to read. But if you, if you wrote a messier dirty equals object, like it should just contain strings, then it's not very useful. And one thing I should say is that if you use dirty equals, it doesn't stop you from using everything else in PyTest. Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, if it makes more sense to do the pattern you described, you can just use that for that test. Thank you. Hi, um, I have maybe a bit of a stupid question, but uh, considering all these magic methods that you mentioned, could we go even more postmodern and do it like dirty uh, subtraction, dirty power, dirty multiplication? Like, doesn't have to be equals, right? Yes, so you could, but you, you probably have to be smarter than me. So I, I mucked around with them after doing this talk, and it, it was a, kind of harder than I thought. But um, I think the true div example is like a, a simpler way to do it, where you, can, you don't have to get into the logic of the order and not mm -hmm. implemented. Um, you can just overload a method. So I don't, I don't know what the Dunder method is for multiplication, but I mean, why would you want to do that out of curiosity? How, why would, how would you want to change Just because it's fun, no? Just yeah, it is because fun. Can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you want to do that, I would recommend having a look at the Python like, object operator docs. There's a, there's, well, it's one of the resources in my slide, where it has all the Dunder methods yeah. that you can overload. Also, if you yeah. find um, Maxim Danilov, yeah. he has a very cool project where he's doing something similar to that. Let's give a big applause to Alexandra.